you for having me. This is uh, a new way to do programs, Zoom meetings. I, uh, I love to meet people in person, so this is a little difficult for me, but we'll get through it. Um, I'm gonna talk about hummingbirds. I'm not sure if there's anybody out there who doesn't like hummingbirds. Uh, so I thought I would give you some information about it. And uh, certainly Lois is familiar with it. We'll talk about that later. So hummingbirds, they are unique to the Western hemisphere. There are about 330 some uh, of the species. They keep discovering new ones. Uh, but here in North America, we have about 15 that are breeding species. And we have about five or six that visit North America on occasion. The smallest one is a bee hummingbird, two inches long in Cuba. And actually the largest is called the giant hummingbird, eight inches long. It lives in the Andes mountains of Chile and Argentina. Hummingbirds are quite remarkable. They hold the record for many things in the bird world. They're the tiniest bird. They're the, the most rapid wing beat. They put out the most energy. They have to take in energy to do that. Uh, they have the largest brain and muscles for their body and their feathers are very, very dense. So I thought about what I wanted to talk to you about, and I came up with four adaptations of the hummingbirds that I thought I might tell you some particulars about. Color, flight, tongue, and torpor. First is color. Color on birds is um, reflected Sandy, two ways. can I interrupt? Yeah. yeah. Sandy. Uh -oh. um, uh, Chris, 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 can you mute yourself, please? Yeah, I couldn't. I didn't have a screen for a while. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I th thank you. Got it. And go ahead, Sandy. Okay. So pigmentation on a bird is deposited during the feather growth, just like the pigment in our hair. Well, I now don't have pigment in my hair, but when you have darker hair, you have pigment that gets deposited and it absorbs wavelengths and what's not absorbed is the color that you see. So the red on a cardinal would be the, the pigment that you're going to see. The other one is structural. And what that is, is little tiny platelets in the feathers of the birds that when the light strikes these platelets like a prism, they create the colors. And hummingbirds have the structural pigments in their throat. So that is why sometimes when you look at a hummingbird, you see the color on the male and all you have to do is flick your fingers just a little bit the other way and you can't see it like my two pictures I have here. That is structural, not pigments. And these platelets are in the gorget, which comes from a French word that had to do with the uh, armor that the knights would wear called a gorget to protect their throat and a helmet on some of the hummingbirds that are in North America. It has multiple purposes. They can recognize each other with these colors in the gorget. They can recognize if it's an adult. They can recognize if it's the opposite sex. It also helps to distract predators. <clears throat> but the main, main reason why we got these iridescent gorget feathers is sex. <laughs> Pick me, pick me. I'm the one who wants 
wants you to see me and therefore those platelets, the hummingbird needs to get to a point where the female sees the light reflected off of the prism and sees these gorgeous gorget colors. Second adaptation has to do with flight. And I know we're up on top of Hawk Mountain watching the eagles go by and their flight is just incredible. But for a hummingbird, they can hover, fly backwards, up and down, all different crazy ways. Their forward flight is very fast and a quarter of their weight is in their breast muscles, in their pectoral muscles to give them that ability to be able to maneuver the way that they maneuver. <clears throat> their structural, their wing bones are fixed, not, not like where you and I can bend at the elbow. So they're um, fixed and the only place that it can rotate is at the shoulders. So by doing this figure eight rotation, they get lift on both the upbeat and the downbeat as they're flying. Think about a red tail hawk. They're getting it when they do the downbeat, gives them the lift. But for these guys, they can do it both ways. Ah, uh, the tongue of a hummingbird. Being a, an environmental educator for many years, we used to teach the children that a hummingbird's tongue was like a straw that you would suck up the nectar. Well, we found out once technology got us to the point of seeing what their tongue looked like, they're not a straw. The tongue is split into two halves and they are fringes on the edge. And when the hummingbird goes, puts its tongue into the nectar, the nectar is drawn onto these fringes. The tongue goes back into the mouth. And when the tongue comes back out, it gets squeezed down the throat. And if we really think about it for a minute, they wouldn't be wasting all of their time inhaling like a straw. No, all they have to do is flick that tongue in and out and they're bringing the nectar down into their throat and don't have to think about the breathing while they do it. If, if I understood PowerPoints enough, I would have a video to show you, but at least I figured out how to put the pictures on of, of how this tongue is split like this. The fourth adaptation that I thought about telling you about is torpor. Torpor is a mini hibernation. It's an overnight survival technique that hummingbirds use they lower their heart rate, they lower their temperature, their respiration. They don't have down feathers like a Canada goose. So they have to have something that's gonna help them when it gets cold out. And by going into torpor, they can survive through the night. And then in the morning, they will shiver to bring their temperature back up so that they can go and start feeding. They can be in torpor from completely overnight. There's no problem with that. If you ever find a hummingbird that's hanging off of your feeder or is sitting on a ledge or on the ground and looks like it's dead and it's been a cold night, just leave it go until you can see if it comes out of its torpor to continue its daily routine. There are many names the hummingbirds go by. Some of them are just fantastic, like topaz and, and um, racket tail and emerald. 
We have hummingbirds in North America, although they have changed the name now of the blue-throated hummingbird. It's now put back into the category of mountain gems. So the blue-throated hummingbird is now the blue-throated mountain gem. Um, but definitely the English language has given us many words <laughs> to call these beautiful birds. So let's talk about the one that we're familiar with, the ruby-throated hummingbird. They are found on the East Coast, all the way into the Midwest. You will notice from the map that they are even found up in Alberta and Manitoba, and some have been sighted in British Columbia. So they are quite the, the far-reaching species in North America. This map was from uh, a, a website that a gentleman was keeping track of first time people observed hummingbirds coming back in spring migration. I do not believe it's up and running anymore. So the ruby throated hummingbird is about three grams. That's about a dime between a dime and a penny. It's three to four inches long. Males are slightly smaller than females. Uh, you can tell that if they're near each other, but not far away. They have a green back. They have a black chin underneath their beak. The males have the ruby red gorget with the white band. And the females have the all white throat and chin. And in the birding world, they have separate gender roles. The male mates and defends his territory. The female takes care of raising the young, uh, building her nest and her own and taking um, defending her own feeding territory. At feeders where territories overlap, there can be quite the commotion as they vigorously try to to defend what, what is rightfully theirs. They are long distance migrants. They will winter in Southern United States. They will go across the Gulf of Mexico to Mexico and Central America, uh, down about as far as Panama. In the spring here in Pennsylvania, they start arriving in late April, early May. Fall, fall migration is mid-July and August. We think of fall migration as being October, November, but for ruby-throated hummingbirds, they are on their way south as soon as they're done with their roles up here. Males go first, females leave then, and then the young follow. They do not fly as uh, a family. They are solitary migrants. So we had a lot of questions, uh, different bird banders, especially the ones I would talk to down in Fort Morgan, Alabama, about um, what helps the hummingbirds to migrate south and, and north. And what's their timing? Where are they coming from and going? How far north do they really go? Those type of questions. And we started asking about that. We know in the spring that ruby-throated hummingbirds will leave Cancun and the Yucatan Peninsula and head straight across the Gulf. They have one purpose in mind. I need to get back north to the best breeding site and claim my territory. But in the fall, we aren't sure if they're just going to take their good old time going south. Are they going to jump across the Gulf or are they going to go around Texas, past Galveston, Brownsville, and down that way? We really don't have a, enough of information to answer the question. 
So that's where bird banding comes into play. And bird banding is a method of putting a numbered aluminum band on the leg of a bird that's been captured. This is done to all species of birds. The bands are specific sizes so that they do not interfere with the bird's life or crimp the bird's leg. So when you catch a bird and you put the band on, and then we age and sex it and measure it and send it on its way. And that is how we can gather as much information as possible in a short amount of time. It's a way to study, <coughs> study their migration. It's a way to figure out their lifespan and also to track them. If a bird bander catches one that has a band on, there is a process of submitting the number to find out where that bird was, how long ago it was banded. And that data is all collected by the bird banding lab down in Patuxent, Maryland. Huge computer database that the banders are able to access uh, as they work on some of these research questions about birds. For hummingbirds, it's a little bit different than a songbird. Songbirds, you use uh, nets that you put up in the woods. Hummingbirds need a trap. And we use a trap that we put the feeder inside and then we pull up the door. And when the hummingbird goes in to feed, the door is dropped and then we extract the bird from inside the cage. We have to um, be very patient because remember I said hummingbirds can fly backwards, forwards, up and down, upside down. I have seen that. They can be out of a trap before the door is down. That's how fast the hummingbird can be. Somebody asked me one day the, uh, the photo on the left, there's two black strips. Uh, that is my way of making sure that the hummingbird is not injured if the door closes on the bird. There are actually sponges there that come down. And if the bird is in between them, it does not hurt them. So somebody asked me that the other day. This is the band that goes on a hummingbird. This is the band. There's a letter and five digits on it. And that is what we, we register with the bird banding lab. And I have other equipment. I have specially made pliers that help me to make sure I do not squish the bird's leg. I have a full set of pliers for songbirds uh, so that it guarantees me that it's not gonna squish it. And I have my calipers and my rulers to use. And I think if you can see it, I have a sophisticated piece of equipment there. I have a, a straw that I use to blow on the belly. <laughs> So I have six locations in Pennsylvania that I go to regularly uh, to try to track this migration. You'll notice that the four in the middle are in the ridge and valley system of Pennsylvania. That is something I'm very interested in. Do they follow the ridges? Do they, do they follow the valley? My site up north is in the plateau up in Potter County. And then the other one is in the valley uh, of Lancaster County. Just to, to try to test which one do I get the most migrating through. The homes that I go to have many, many, many feeders. The one home I ha go to has 25 feeders. She goes through 200 pounds of sugar a summer. And we have um, been going there for quite a while. 
And then my other two sites, my other sites have numerous feeders. One feeder doesn't make it. I need lots of feeders in order to do my research. How do I do this? Use this. This one. Okay, I'm going to try something here for everybody. This is one of my homes. And that's on a typical July day. Okay. Next slide. My technical advisor sitting behind me, teaching me how to do this. All right, so I have a bird. I have, I have banded it. I have to determine if it's male or female. Well, that's easy with the adults. The female doesn't have the red gorget. But juveniles, the male and female, can have totally white gorgets. So I have to, had to come up with a way in which to, to, uh, to get its sex. Well, we had to start out with his age. So when I catch a hummingbird, I use an optical loop and I look at the bill of a hummingbird to see if there are wrinkles going down the bill. When the bird comes out of the nest as a young, its bill is still wrinkled. It's still growing. So I can tell if that's a juvenile or if it's a very smooth bill, I have an adult. Then somebody figured this out. I look at the sixth primary and if it's scalloped at the end with webbing on only one side of the feather, I have a male. If it's rounded with webbing on both sides, I have a female. And that's how I do this in July and August, figuring out these young birds, whether they are juvenile or adult or male or female. Now, by the end of August, the males will start getting big boy feathers. They'll have two or three uh, red feathers, which tell me right away that it's, that it's a male. <clears throat> At my one site, the one that I showed you the video, <clears throat> I've done about 1,300 birds there. And surprisingly, I have a 20% recapture rate. <clears throat> And at my center county up near State College, I've banded 2,800 and have had about a 22% recapture rate. So that's telling us that these birds are using the same stopover locations in their migration. They know where their food source is on their way north and south. The center county site. Um, there were three of us who have banded there since 2007. We are now up to about 4,000 hummingbirds that we've banded at this woman's home that goes through so much sugar, so much sugar, but it's her passion. And we appreciate it because we're learning a lot about hummingbirds just in this location, right on the, at the bottom of one of the ridges through the ridge and valley system. I found two interesting recaps I thought I'd share with you. I had an adult female in 2015 that I caught three years after that. Uh, I really hoped to catch it this past year, but it did not. Up at State College, I had an adult female that I caught in 2014 and recaught it this year. So it's at least eight years old. It could be older. And if I catch her next year, she will be a longevity record. So we're hoping that she comes back again. Now you have to think about this, this female. 
She is traveling up and down the East Coast, the United States, 16 times, at least 16 times. Just an incredible migration feat for any kind of a bird. So hummingbirds aren't just for summer anymore. That's something that we found to start to find out. For many years, people would say, oh, I forgot to take my feeder down, and oh, I have a hummingbird. And we would tell them, oh, make it leave, make, make it migrate, or, or it's sick. You, you, know, you, you can't let it stay there. Well, the banders in the southern states started to pay attention, and they started to catch Western hummingbirds all through the winter in the Southern states. So then they convinced a colleague of mine in the Carolinas to try it out, pay attention to those birders who would make this comment. Then it got to us in Pennsylvania and we decided we're gonna pay attention. We're gonna drive these people's homes and try to trap a hummingbird and see what it is that they have. Well, surprise, surprise, we started to catch rufous hummingbirds, a Western hummingbird. And we started to catch not only adults, but juveniles. To the point that we've now caught over 173 rufous hummingbirds in Pennsylvania. Then we caught Allens. Allens hummingbirds are from the western edge of California. And we have caught six of them in Pennsylvania. Now, this is a very difficult bird to ID because you need to look at the outer tail feather and measure it very carefully to see what the width is to separate it from the rufous. And we did have an Allens that was caught, that I caught in Delaware County last November and identified it, measured it. We knew it was an Allens. And about a month later, I got another phone call from a gentleman near Fairmont Park in Philadelphia, went to his home. Lo and behold, it was the same Allen's hummingbird. It had traveled 13 miles due east, and we're hoping it shows up again this winter. Then we've caught tiny, tiny little calliopes. And they are tiny compared to ruby throats. When you've held 4,000 ruby throats in your hand, and you pull a calliope out, you know you have a very tiny bird, very tiny. Um, and we've caught four of them in Pennsylvania now. I got a phone call to go down to Chambersburg and ended up catching a black-chinned hummingbird in November. I seem to recall it was howling winds like today. And thank heavens it was a male because the females are very difficult to tell apart from their cousins, the ruby throats. But uh, we've caught three of them now uh, here in Pennsylvania. And then we have Lois's bird, the Annas that I caught last, two, two years ago, two years that we caught. Um, I will tell you a little story that after I was done banding this bird and doing everything, I was still perplexed because this bird did not have any wrinkles on its bill, which said to me it was an adult. But look at the head on the right hand picture. That is not an adult male Anna's hummingbird. He doesn't have the full helmet or the gorget. And the hummingbird banders world, we all share things. And to be able to call my trainer and mentor in Southwest Texas and talk to him about this, 
he had me understand that Anna's nest in February and March. Yeah. So by November, all of the wrinkles were gone in the bill. And that's why I was perplexed about it. So I you always learn from each other. We're constantly uh, giving each other information to help when we're doing this research project. And then of course, in 2013, I went to a home in mid-April, just as the ruby throats were coming back. Woman who had an unusual uh, looking hummingbird and it took us four days. We were not thinking outside the box. It ended up being a Bahama wood star, a non-migratory hummingbird from the islands that most likely storm systems swept it north into Pennsylvania and over 200 people got to see this continental record. So, well, this screen is already outdated because as of yesterday, I have banded 191 Western hummingbirds in Pennsylvania. I had one about an hour north of me two days ago. And yesterday, uh, for your sightings report, I banded a, an adult female Rufus in Chester County near Pottstown. I just visited the house yesterday and we were able to catch it very quickly. So our Rufuses are up to 175 already. So we're off to a great start this winter. I have caught a Rufus two, uh, two years in a row at the same house. Um, I've had one house that's had three different species of hummingbirds at her house. Um, now, I don't want you to think, don't try not to think of the Piedmont down in your area as the only place that you see these hummingbirds. You have to remember that we, up for at least for me, I was doing this while I was working and there was only two of us for a while. So to get into the Northern counties, drive all the way to Pittsburgh to try to ban a bird, sometimes it just didn't work out. But we had banders in the Southeast of Pennsylvania for many years. And that's why it looks like there's so many hummingbirds in the Southeast. But now that we have banders in around the state, we're starting to find that they're, they're coming in at other places. What's the next one that might be on the target list? Well, we had a broad-tailed hummingbird that was caught in North Carolina about a month ago. So there is that possibility and broad builds are caught quite frequently in the Southern states. So that might be on our radar and on your radar as birders to watch for these two hummingbird species. So there are only four of us in Pennsylvania who do this now. We did have five, but uh, Scott Widensall moved to New Hampshire. Yeah. So I am, I am the only bander from Altoona to the Eastern border of Pennsylvania. So I do quite a bit of traveling. The other three are in Pittsburgh, Lock Haven, and way up in Caldersport. Um, so if, if you find a hummingbird, you contact me and I'm on my way. The best part is hummingbird hosts. They are so loyal to their hummingbirds and we have great time with them. Um, I always try to have the opportunity to put them the hummingbird in their hand to release them. I teach them how to keep their nectar, their sugar water warm and keep it from freezing. 
and they are always dil diligent to take care of their hummingbirds. So what can you do? Well, put up some feeders, especially during the summer. Put them up. Remember that it's four parts of water to one part sugar. I unfortunately only get one or two hummingbirds a summer. So I put one tablespoon of sugar and four tablespoons of water at a time in my feeder. And then when it starts to get cloudy, I change it right away. Keep your feeders clean, keep them up long into November, December that you can and call us, social media, Facebook, all of those, all of those birding groups uh, can get a hold of me and, uh, and we will check it out for you. Remember that the nectar is their Mountain Dew or Pepsi. It's their carbohydrate. They also eat insects for their protein. So they don't live on the nectar. If your sugar water runs out, they're out there looking for sap in the tree and catching bugs. There are some things not to do. Please don't put red dye in your sugar water. No molasses, no brown sugar. They have this new golden sugar out that's unprocessed molasses. No additives. You don't. I saw an advertisement about give the hummingbirds what they're lacking, give them electrolytes. The hummingbirds understand what they're looking for for their diet. Sugar water is as close to the nectar of a flower as we can get. Okay. And of course, plant lots of flowers, bee bombs and salvias and coral bells, some penstemons, trumpet honeysuckle. Watch out that you don't get the trumpet vine, the trumpet honeysuckle, jewelweed is a flower that the hummingbirds love. They are pollinators. They stick their bills inside those tubular shapes and they transfer the pollen. They do prefer red, oranges, and pinks and it is full of nectar. And if you watch them carefully, they will come back to the same flower about every 15 to 20 minutes. So that's what I do. Uh, I call it birding with a purpose. I research, I chase these hummingbirds that uh, these wonderful folks get a hold of me to tell me about. And uh, I never did get to meet you, Lois, but I had a wonderful time in your driveway. And uh, <laughs> a wonderful time having everybody. <laughs> and uh, um, it's a research that is important. When I went for my permit, I wanted to compare ruby-throated data to 50 years ago. Bird banding lab told me nobody had collected ruby-throated hummingbird data to date. So that is my main project is creating a database for the future. But then my secondary project is to chase these Western hummingbirds and uh, to document them. So, so that's my program. Oh, the end. 